Size isn't everything, but it can certainly help in war. So when preparing for war, it's often a good idea to find the biggest, strongest, and most durable warriors to fight for your side. And for the Vikings, with such mighty warriors as Raider and Warlord, they still needed a little extra. So they called in the Highlander. Highlander rushes into the battlefield with a massive sword, a Scottish flair, and a willingness to decapitate. But who is the Highlander? What is he based on? Let's talk about it. Welcome back to Heroes in History, where we take a look at all of For Honor's heroes and discuss who they were most likely based on and whether or not they do their counterpart justice. And today, we are talking about the Highlander. Now, Highlander, as many of you know, is a name that directly references to the Highlanders of Scotland, so it would be pretty easy to assume that the Highlander is based on the medieval Scottish warriors. And you wouldn't be entirely wrong either. The lore of For Honor claims that the Highlanders are not actually Vikings themselves, but have an alliance with the Vikings. They live within their own homelands, which are apparently ravaged by weather and storms. They prefer to keep to themselves and defend their lands, but supposedly there are alliances and oaths in place between the Vikings and Highlanders that have now pulled them into the Heathmore conflict. This implies a grudge of some kind of previous conflict or animosity between the two, which fits because the season in which Highlander was introduced was called Grudge and Glory, Glory referencing Gladiator and Grudge therefore referencing Highlander. But this grudge actually ties into history. Time for a history lesson. In the early ages of the Vikings, the Vikings of Scandinavia and Norway realized that there was plenty of plunder to be had in the areas of Britain, Ireland, and Scotland, but more specifically Britain. The Scottish Isles would be an excellent place to set up a jump-off location for easy access to Britain. This meant that they had to establish fortifications and settlements there, and that proved challenging but eventually successful. The natives at that time along the coast in the outlying isles were strong and burly but not organized enough to handle the Viking raiders. The real primary problem the Vikings faced was a lack of tree supply for building homes. They solved this by building homes and structures out of stone and other products. Eventually, the Isles of Scotland, including Skye, Orkney, Man, and Shetland, were controlled and owned by the Vikings, giving them an excellent staging ground for their raids on Britain. That said, the centralmost lands of Scotland were a bit more complicated. The warriors there were so strong that even the Romans knew better than to try to take them over. The Romans couldn't conquer them, and even the British couldn't quite conquer them. The Scotland lands, then, were home to two groups, the Picts and the Scots. The Picts were the Celtic aboriginals of Scotland, who we will talk about in another video. The Scots, though, are a Gaelic people believed to have originated in Ireland, and then their ancestors traveled to Scotland. Luckily for the Vikings, the Picts and the Scots were at constant war with each other, meaning that the Vikings could take advantage of that conflict and raid, pillage, and massacre without a united Scotland to stand against them. Within 50 years, the Vikings controlled much of mainland Scotland. However, in 839, something unexpected happened. After a battle between the Scots and the Picts where the Picts were victorious, the Vikings emerged and rushed the Picts, crushing them quickly and effectively before the Picts could complete their victory. This allowed the new king of the Scots, Kenneth McAlpin, to take his father's place and begin waging a campaign against the now beaten and war-torn Picts. Soon, Kenneth managed to conquer most of the Pict lands and thus became the first united king of both Scots and Picts, unifying Scotland once again, though a bit incomplete, I admit. Now, when the Vikings arrived in force with 140 ships in the year 848, the United Scottish Warriors met them in battle. They did lose, but the Scottish and Picts were able to retreat deep into Pict territory where they were now welcome, and the Vikings were not equipped enough to pursue or fight their way into the Pict territory. The territory became known as Alba, and it became the solidified home of the United Scottish peoples. The final Viking raid on Scotland from Normandy took place in the Battle of Largs in 1293 AD, and this would see the end of Viking invasions. However, the infiltration of Vikings into the Scottish culture had already begun. And knowing that they could not dislodge the Scots and Picts totally, the Vikings began settling in through social, economical, agricultural, and political methods. Over the years, Norsemen began to intermarry with the local Scottish peoples and alliances were forged. Not unlike Ireland or British territories, ethnicity played less and less of a role in terms of alliances and more on what was convenient. Scottish kings might fight against a Viking clan one year, but then ally with another clan for an entirely different engagement. The Viking culture had created a lasting impact on Scotland that can still be felt today. This is likely the origin of the grudge that we see in For Honor. The Vikings in For Honor likely raided and sacked the Scottish lands as they did in history, and though they were not fully victorious enough to claim the lands as their own, the Scottish knew that they could not claim total victory over the Vikings either. Thus, an alliance was made. An oath. The Vikings would not sack or raid Scottish soil again, and would allow the Scottish to live as they pleased. 
trading with Vikings from time to time and allowing a sharing of resources. But the Highlanders must be ready and able to fight with the Vikings in the event of war. Thus, unwillingly, the Highlanders are here to battle alongside the Vikings for the sake of their homelands. Ancient alliances kept their lands safe, but their oaths have come due. They join our war out of obligation, but they are not to be underestimated. So, now that we know the history of Viking and Scottish culture, what about who the Highlanders are specifically? Well, considering their claymore, and I know, I know, I'll talk about the sword in a minute, but roll with me on this. Considering their claymore, the best connection I found between the Highlander and history would be the Gallo Glass. The, gla the Gallo Glass were mercenaries hired by Irish nobles and armies before the advent of gunpowder. Many have tried to tell me that the sword they are using is called a gla Gallo Glass, and this isn't quite true, as the name Gallo Glass comes from the Irish Gallo Gla, which means foreign warriors. However, the sword itself could be considered a Gallo Glass sword because it was famously used by the Gallo Glass warriors, and we will get to that momentarily. The Gallo Glass was from Norse Gaelic clans in Scotland. These Gallo Glass were likely the offspring of the Viking and Scottish intermarriages and cultural exchanges that we talked about. They were very popular during the 13th to 16th century as infantry, larger and strong warriors wearing heavy armor and capable of capturing and holding a position very easily, not unlike how Highlander is so good at holding zones and enduring attacks with his hyper armor. Over time, the Gallo Glass became so useful and renowned to the Irish that the name was less about their ethnicity as foreigners and became a term for just the kind of warrior that they were. The Gallo Glass became something akin to a knight, too, as in exchange for their services to Irish lords, nobles, and kings, they were often rewarded with a plot of land and were able to accept the bounty of those who worked in, not unlike a fief. Even his spear-throwing feat has a connection to his history, as some Gallo Glass traveled along with a squire of sorts, or assistant, who carried their spears for them. Their armor usually consisted of mail or an iron helmet, and their choice weapon, which was often a long spear, or claymore. Now, let's talk about that word. As many have pointed out to me and in several other videos, the massive great sword that the Highlander walks around with is not a claymore. For one thing, it's far too big to be a claymore. In fact, it's far more similar to large Zweihanders used by the Landsknecht. And secondly, in the 18th century, claymores were often considered to be many kinds of basket-hilted swords found in the Scottish Isles, which were given that moniker and are still monikered that way today. So why then do we call this massive thing a claymore? Is it just the Ferrara devs not knowing what a claymore is? Well, no, because technically, by the literal definition, it could be a claymore. The word claymore comes from the Scottish Clyde de Moor. I'm sure I mispronounced that, but bear with me, which means great sword or large sword. It is documented that the Scottish used rather large long swords as early as the 15th century and onto the 17th century, and it was noted in the 19th century that these swords were also referred to as Clydemore swords or claymores. It is speculated but debated that the original term for claymore was applied to the basket hilt swords of the Scots because they were larger than the average basket hilt sword around that time. But soon the term came to be applied to many other large swords in Scotland, including the larger long swords used by the Scottish. The sword being used by Highlander is a great sword, a sword requiring two hands to use and being as large if not larger than the warrior's own body. However, the style of the sword, as well as connection to historical records, it fits the literal definition of a claymore. To be more accurate, it should have been somewhat shorter, perhaps as long as Warmonger's sword, as the average claymore was about 55 inches in length, being 4.5 feet, while this claymore that the Highlander carries looks closer to 5 or 6 feet long, depending on how huge Highlander is. So yes, to everyone crying, Highlander's sword isn't a real claymore, know that your voices have been heard, and I do agree with you. It is far too big to be a claymore, and it's certainly not a basket-hilted sword. That being said, it is modeled after real great swords used in Scotland that were classified as Clydemore, which is the full word for claymore. So there is some truth to it. It's not all fabrication and misinformation. I see where they're getting their reference. The Highlanders were likely named for and based on the Highlander warriors of Scotland during the wars for Scottish independence, considering they were famous for their use of the claymore. But I believe the Gallo Glass are a far more accurate comparison based on how they were initially treated by the Irish, literally being given a name that connotates their foreignness. The fact that they were fighting alongside Ken, though begrudgingly, and their fierce reputation to outsiders are staunch, powerful, 
and immovable. You see, strength is a powerful tool, and so are weapons. But perhaps the greatest tool for forging a warrior is experience. The Highlanders have endured storms, wars, and conflict from all fronts. They have stood strong in the face of trials, great and small, and thus, they know how to stand tall in war. The elements battering their lands have made them strong. War has made them deadly. And against the valiant knights, the noble samurai, and the cunning Wulin, the Vikings could ask for no greater ally than these mighty warriors of the Isles. And, after all, as we all know, when you choose the strongest warrior to support your team, there can be Thank you guys for watching, and I will see you in my next video. Take care. You lost so Another one. Another one. Another one. Oh no! Another one. Well, that's the way you end a Dominion match, eh, lads?